Good morning. Um, my name is David Rosen. I'm professor of uh, anthropology uh, here at Fairleigh Dickinson University's College of Florham in New Jersey. And I am very pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Alec Borgo, speaking today on behalf of the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict. Mr. Borgo serves as a program officer in the office of the special representative for the Secretary General, and before his current post, he spent many years working in the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the UN uh, HCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. He has an extensive experience in working as an advocate, advisor, and activist for children's protection and rights in the world. Thank you for joining us today at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. I'm also very pleased to welcome Ambassador Kamal, a great friend of Fairleigh Dickinson University, who has done so much to make these programs possible. Ambassador Kamal served as the Pakistani ambassador to the United Nations and in many other important posts at the UN. He is currently the founder and president of the United Nations Ambassador Club. Thank you very much for being here, Ambassador Kamal. I'm also pleased to welcome the participation of our external sites, uh, the Bronx Community College, Lock Haven University in Pennsylvania, uh, Mercy College in New York, Towson University in Maryland, as well as the sister campus of Fairleigh Dickinson University in Vancouver, in British Columbia, and of course uh, our own two campuses here, the Metro Campus and, uh, and, the, and the campus of the College of Flora. The topic today is children, the world's greatest victims of armed conflict. As many of us are aware, um, children have been caught up in conflict for many years, both as civilians and combatants. There are widespread reports of the presence of child soldiers, for example, in the civil wars going on right now in Syria and, and in the recent civil war in, in Libya. And of course, many, many students in America became familiar with this issue via the viral video, Coney 2012, which detailed the operations of the Lord's Resistance Army and its leader, Joseph Coney, in Uganda and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The format of our program today will be the usual one. Uh, Mr. Wargo and Ambassador Kamal will open with a uh, discussion of the issues. Following this, there will be a question and answer session. There will be two questions each from the participating institutions. And if time permits, we will try for a second round of questions. So without any um, further delay, let me turn this over to Ambassador Kamal. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you at Fairleigh Dickinson and with all the other universities, Bronx, Lockhaven, Mercy, Towson, Vancouver, and of course, uh, Teaneck and Madison. Uh, and I'm delighted to see the excellent attendance uh, at uh, the sites which we have in front of us. So quite obviously, uh, the subject of children in armed conflict is of great interest to everybody. And so, like you, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Mr. Vargo for taking time off to spend time with us. Other than that extensive experience which he has, and I can only advise you not to be carried away by his youthful looks, uh, this person is made of stainless steel, and he, he, he is half German, half American, and is therefore one of the committed members of the United Nations system. And therefore, it is uh, an opportunity for us to have him walk us through uh, this problem of children in our country. <clears throat> I'd like to take issue with Professor Rosen when he says that children are the greatest victims of armed conflict. I'm not sure of whether they are the greatest victims, yes or no. The problem is that wars and conflicts are fundamental parts of human history. Human history is not about peace and security and motherhood and apple pie. Human history is about wars and conflicts and uh, expansion and domination and nastiness. That is what is the history of the world. And so the question is, what is it that motivates us? We basically look like all oh, very decent human beings, certainly the ones in front of us at these seven universities, and so does Mr. Vargo. And yet from time to time, we go haywire 
And when we go haywire, we do the most awful things. We are just one day out of this extraordinary incident of terrorism, which has taken place in Boston on a day of happiness and sports with thousands of sportsmen from all over the world congregating in a, an event celebrating Patriots Day. And then suddenly you have bombs starting to explode. And so there is something, as I said, nasty about us. Part of that nastiness comes out in the concept of domination. We love domination of all sorts. Men have been dominating women for 10,000 years. Women are half of humanity and they are the guarantors of the future. Men's role is totally secondary in, in, uh, in reproduction or in the guarantee of the future. Women are the primary uh, actors on the scene. And yet, men have got away with the domination of women. Men have gone away, got away with the domination of people less fortunate or with a different skin color. And so we just went into Africa, hijacked people, uh, converted them into slaves, etc. And now we find that there is a third element of domination in which we are picking up children and instead of giving them love and affection and care as people who will be the actors of the future, we are misusing them either by ignoring them altogether, as we do in most underdeveloped countries, or by using them as labor, bonded labor, where children are being used as semi-slaves, if you wish, in factories making bricks or in, in, in other types of factories. And yet again now, we are using them as semi-slaves by giving them guns and asking them to go and fight. So, there's somebody talking over me, not listening. Paul, could you please tell people to stay silent? Either they are interested in the subject or they want to have a conversation. If they want a conversation, let them go elsewhere. But as long as they are in the video conference, they must pay attention. So back to children. Children are important. We all know that they are important. And yet we don't seem to be able to muster the energy that is necessary in order to give them what I call care and affection and love and training in order to build them up for the future. Now, one of the problems of armed conflict is that those who are conducting the armed conflict think that they are also training children for the future. That the future is one of conflict in which you have to win a conflict and so the better trained you have children who can stand up and fight for themselves, the better off they will be once the conflict has been won. And so I have two questions that I would like to address to Mr. Vargo. The first is, I want to know exactly what he does. He's been in uh, children in arms conflict for, I don't know, seven or 10 years. What are the trends? What are the statistics? Is it something which is casual and only happens in some places or is it more widespread and is it increasing or is it being contained? I don't know. And so Mr. Vargo has to tell us what are the trends of children in armed conflict. The second problem is more serious. I want to know what are the motivations behind those who put children into armed conflict? Children are vulnerable because they are young and uh, they are a vulnerable part of society. And so a vulnerable part of society is being put on the front line. And that what must be representative of some very deep motivation is that motivation one of an injustice in which governments are not quite representative of the people, so there is conflict for peoples who want to fight in order to get power. 
and that is the people in the United States understand this totally because you went exactly through this 200 years ago in the war of independence because the country was being dominated and depressed by external forces called the Red Courts and they had to be thrown out. And so there was a conflict and in the conflict everybody put uh, a gun to his shoulder and that was men, women and children, everybody stood together as a militia in order to get rid of the oppressor. And so is the motivation a motivation against oppressors in these conflicts? Or is it that people just want to have fun with guns? Because that also is a, a, a sort of a disease. It's a disease which is called the Second Amendment. Everybody has the right to bear arms. And so if everybody has the right to bear arms, then everybody will like to use and fire those arms. And that includes the children also. And so it is not surprising that in the United States, which is a highly developed, highly decent country, children at the age of six have taken the pistols to their primary school and have shot another child at the age of six. And so what is this culture of guns? Is that a motivation that we like to be able to press a little trigger and see the result of what happens as a result of pressing the trigger? So what are the motivations? And that is my second question to Mr. Vargo. Mr. Vargo, the floor is yours. It's not going to be easy because there are too many people interested and the questions are tough. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Um, what, uh, your first question was, what do I do? And so I, uh, again, I work for a, an office that specializes in uh, dealing with the, um, the impact of armed conflict on children. Um, one of them is child soldiers. Uh, the other uh, has to do with uh, the impact of, of bombardments, um, lack of humanitarian access to children, what happens to them when war rolls over the territory where they live, whether or not it's a part of a functioning uh, nation state or an area that has had c conflict over, over time. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background of where I come from, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in peacekeeping in, in the Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. I spent about four and a half years there. Uh, where I was one of the first child protection advisors for, for the peacekeeping uh, operation there. And that was very telling in the sense that you had a trend, and I, you asked me about trends there, Ambassador, um, a trend of massive use of children uh, throughout the east of the country, and, and in fact all the way into the west of the country. You had probably, we estimate, we can't ever know how many child soldiers there had, have uh, been used in the DRC conflict, but we estimate probably about 60,000. Uh, of which we had access to about 25,000 through demobilization programs with uh, UN agencies like, like UNICEF. But my job wasn't to, to take care of them. Uh, my job was to try to, to advocate with armed groups, and there were about 15 in the area that I was working in, in the Kivus, which is right, uh, right up to, to uh, Rwanda, uh, where the, some of the hottest conflict was there, was to, to uh, reach out with uh, the imprimatur of the Security Council uh, to, to speak with those armed groups in order to, for them to release the children that they had, those children under 18 years of age. Uh, in Congo, what you have, or what you had until recently, uh, were children as young as eight uh, who were using guns, uh, who were war wives, uh, basically systematic rape. Uh, you had those who were forced to porter. Um, children I've met who who'd come out of armed groups in, in eastern Congo came as far as uh, 1,300 kilometers away. So they had spent some time, sometimes two or three years with an armed group. But and when we talk about trends, you have you have I would call your Central African trends, which are those where children may have ideological um, affiliation with a, with a portion of a, with these revolutionary groups, but they had, tend to be more abducted or to have been promised money uh, when they were from a, a, a not a wealthy uh, area and, and they were tricked into it. But I've just come back uh, about four weeks ago from, from the border regions of Syria where I was doing uh, research for the Security Council's report on children in armed conflict there. And that is very, very different. Uh, you have two different um, uh, trends inside of the Syrian conflict. You have uh, the Syrian government, which is uh, not necessarily recruiting children, uh, or not that we know of yet, 
uh, but they, who detain children that are suspected of, of having uh, affiliation with the uh, Free Syrian Army or other groups. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, administering sometimes torture, sometimes torture to death. Uh, you also have uh, the FSA, which is now uh, in our latest um, uh, research, uh, it does have association of children with its forces, but it's not uh, the same as in Congo. Nobody is being abducted for it. Uh, they are with their clan, with their with their parents, uh, and they're fighting alongside them, uh, which is oftentimes even harder to pick apart uh, when you want to to uh, to children to not be involved in that those armed conflicts. We also have the massive use of cluster munitions in Syria, uh, and I've seen more children without arms and legs than I ha ever have in my life, and I've seen a lot. Uh, you have uh, a devastating impact on, on just a lot of dead children or maimed children, uh, which I haven't seen before as well. So you have those sorts of trends. You also have a trend, for example, in Myanmar, where we have just signed an agreement with the government to release what we assume are probably 10 or 12,000 child soldiers, where things have calmed down uh, with regard to the national forces, but we're also trying to reach out to the six or seven uh, non-state forces to get their children out. So I think on trends, Ambassador, uh, the trend is probably flat. Uh, in some regions of the world, uh, in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, we've seen some, uh, some, uh, how should we say, some conflicts that have become less hot, have calmed down, and we're able to take children out of, of those uh, circumstances. Um, we also have a, a move now on accountability with the Thomas Lubanga trial, which was a, he was a Congolese warlord who used children, who has now been, uh, his judgment has been passed and has been uh, sentenced, or will be sentenced soon, uh, for, uh, for recruitment and use of children under the age of 15 uh, in those forces. So there is a, there is a moment, with the, I don't think that the trend has lessened, but we have more momentum on accountabilizing those who, uh, who brutalize and use children in, in armed conflict. Um, with regard to motivations, again, uh, as I touched uh, on a little bit before, um, you've got different motivations in different conflicts uh, and different people. Um, when you talk about an eight-year-old who has a, a Kalashnikov in a field in Congo, usually you're talking about an abduction or they just don't know what they're doing um, and they get sucked into it or they're promised pay and they're from uh, broken families uh, that don't have uh, any means to support them and they're promised ten ten dollars a month and so they go off for survival purposes or um, again you have uh, in the Philippines the Moro Islamic Liberation Front uh, has a very big ideological um, spin to it uh, and those children are used by those forces sometimes also for terror acts as you know uh, the UN doesn't use terrorism uh, lightly uh, and we can't even define it but uh, they do. It's, it's, it's as wrong as the abduction, but uh, the way that we address those different trends, a uh, uh, moral Islamic liberation front, is a trend of community-based resistance to a perceived uh, government that is not uh, in line with what they want. You have a Congo where it's absolute chaos and very little ideology, ideology and more just warlordism. And then you have Syria, something in between, which is uh, just a civil war which gets nastier by the day, and they really need the manpower. Uh, and, and in fact, they, when they need the manpower, they go to child power. Uh, and you also see girls being used in that, not only for sexual slavery. Even in the Congo context, you see girls serving um, both as sexual slaves, but also often as combatants. Uh, and you've seen that, for example, much more in the Sri Lanka uh, uh, crisis uh, before it came to an end with the LTTE. They had the entire um, units of girls uh, who were used more or less as... Uh, to be thrown against the, against the army uh, and with with horrible effect. Um, so I think the motivations are it depends on it depends on the situation. It depends on the political um, setup around what's happening in that conflict. It depends on the ideology of those groups or the lack thereof. Um, and then we have a third uh, element, which is what are all what are you know when we talk about Afghanistan, when we talk about. Um, the, the, the groups that use terror tactics, we're seeing a huge upswing in the use of children as, uh, as suicide bombers, unfortunately, as fighters with, with groups that use terror tactics, a huge uh, up, uptick uh, in that. And concomitantly, we see NATO forces, US forces, for example, uh, that are getting involved w uh, uh, against their will, to some extent, uh, because there are so many children involved there. 
they're seeing their forces that they're coming in contact and that's why you see the 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 numbers of, of child casualties for example in Afghanistan include a huge amount of children uh, some of them combatants and some of them not uh, you also see for us a very worrisome trend everywhere of detention of children uh, who are assumed to be associated with arm, armed groups sometimes for very long periods of time uh, Guantanamo had at least seven children that we were dealing with until very, uh, a short while ago uh, we still have a few cases in Afghanistan by international forces that are being held uh, without charge uh, under, we assume, terrorism charges, which for us is very, very worse and there are no safeguards for those children there. Um, and so our office tries to work inside of the UN system, which, as the ambassador I'm sure will, will have told you, is heavily flawed. Uh, and our, our chief acts that we have is that we have the Security Council that has told us Children in armed conflict is not only a, a worrisome issue in general, it is also an issue of of peace and security, which places it very much at the center of uh, the Security Council action uh, and debate. As, as you know, the Security Council is the only organ uh, of, the, of the, or it is the, the primary organ of the, of, the, uh, of the UN that deals with issues of international peace, threats to peace and, uh, and security. Uh, and since they've put that four square into that uh, basket, we have been able to access the power of the uh, the council to influence groups uh, to release children, uh, and what we have are basically contracts that we go out with the uh, with the blessing of the secretary general and the security council to approach those governments who might use uh, children, but also very much most of our clients, unfortunately, are non-state actors who use children uh, to sign uh, an agreement that doesn't recognize them, but that recognizes what they're doing to children and how they can can stop that. So with that, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Ambassador. Uh, two or three uh, sub-questions. The first is I want to know a bit more about the ages of the children, because you've said eight-year-old. Uh, are there a lot of children below the age of 10 or 12, or are they between the ages of 12 and 15? Uh, I want to know the, the statistical uh, age structure. The second question is, you said that they are being tricked by money. Mm. Where is the money coming from? What is the source of the money? Follow the money always. Where is the money coming from and how is the money being generated? And number three, what is the solution? I can see the problem because now I thought this was only a problem in the Eastern Congo. But you say it's in the Congo, it's in Sri Lanka, it's in Myanmar, it's in Afghanistan, it's in Pakistan, it's in uh, Syria. So it's everywhere. If it's everywhere, what is the solution? In other words, can you say we need to do A, B, C, D and it has to be time barred uh, solutions uh, which will be washed up because you brought in the Security Council. The Security Council has enormous powers because it can impose sanctions under Article 41 and it can go to war under Article 42. And so the Security Council has great power of action. What is, uh, what are you doing and how are you bringing the Security Council in? Thank you, Ambassador. Um, with regard to your first question, which was about the ages of children, you're right. Uh, we, we always use the most uh, emblematic examples, which are the youngest children. I've, I've met many children who are eight and nine. Uh, I think, but the, the largest number of, of children that we meet are between, well, let's say, roughly 14 and 18. And for us, uh, because of the optional protocol to the, to the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child on, on the use of children in armed conflict, which is very widely signed, uh, we use 18 as, as, the, as the minimum age. Now, can I interrupt you? That is not fair. <clears throat> because 14 and above, they are almost adults. Uh, the, you have uh, people at, at the age of 14 playing uh, professional football here. And you have 16-year-olds who can drive and That's bash right. up their cars uh, <laughs> in the United States. So what are you talking about? They are grown-ups. Well, I, I, it's a very good question, uh, sir, because uh, I, it, it's one that we have to answer. Uh, we, we, use, uh, we can only use as the United Nations the most... Um, international law that applies. Obviously, a national law applies as well, and it's actually superior in many senses to international law. Uh, but 
it, when you look at uh, minimum age for recruitment and use in armed conflict, uh, the U.S. is a, a signatory as well, even though it hasn't. It's a, it's a bit odd because the U.S. is one of the countries that hasn't signed the, the convention itself, but signed the optional protocol. Who say that you can you can recruit into into an armed force as young as 17, sometimes 16, with the Brits on that one. But most of the world and most national forces have said 18, straight 18. We, we won't take them until 18. And why is that? Uh, even though people can drive cars at 16, I started, I didn't crash my car until I was about 25. But um, we, the, the feeling is from psychiatrists and others who've studied this for, for quite some time is that our death concept, the feeling that we can die or we can impact the world and make others die, doesn't really fully develop to, until 17 or 18. Everyone is different, um, uh, and so there's no one rule for that. But they they feel that generally that our mental makeup uh, by the time we get to 18, we do have a, a well-developed responsibilization of our impact on the, on the, on the, our neighbors and the outside world, as well as what's going to happen to us if we do X or Y. And I think that's why uh, people have agreed that they should not use children till that time because. As we know, there is a special law. Uh, no one really wants to, uh, except for the ambassador who, who admits very, and I agree with him in the sense that war has been around for a long, long time and is here to stay for quite a bit longer, although we work at the edges of it. Um, people feel that um, soldiers do things differently. Uh, they're subject to different laws. They're subject to different behaviors and different accountability mechanisms. And there's a reason for that, because they kill for a living. Uh, and that is, I think, at the heart of why the international community believes very much that we should not touch these kids or at least use them uh, in, in armed conflict until they're 18 years old. And I think that is how we determine that kind of, as you say, very artificial cutoff point of when we can use them and when we can't. Um, the the inter international law that applies to non-state actors is, of course, as... Uh, the optional protocol was designed by member states, so they made it illegal for any armed group that is not a state uh, state party to have children under 18, which I've had many uh, dialogues with non-state actors about. They don't feel that's fair, but um, we don't tend to uh, get into that in too much detail. Um, so most of, the, most of the children that we see are between 14 and 18. Many of them that suffer the hardest impacts, however, are the younger ones, because again, they haven't developed or if they're abducted at 12, they, they don't have the schooling or they probably weren't in school before. And so they come back if they're released or in fact, sometimes they're driven out of these armed groups once the, their purpose is done. Uh, so many kind of exit interviews with these children saying, I've wasted my time. I, I thought I was going to go and, and become an officer in the army, but I don't have an education. And now I have to go back home. And there's a huge security element about that. As even if you have peace, and you have thousands of young people coming out of an armed force, uh, you can have major security problems if you don't address that very, very quickly and get them into something productive. Uh, when you, uh, Ambassador, your, your question about where is the money, or following the money, where does the money come, uh, come, uh, come from? Well, I mean, it, again, it depends very much on, on the country situation that you're looking at. In Congo, it came from, uh, it came from uh, natural resources. It came from gold, coal tan, uh, other mines that various parties who controlled those areas were using and then filtering out through, through various places, including neighboring countries. Uh, now, the, the Security Council has researched that. Can I cut you for a minute? Yeah. Because I want everybody to know the word coal tan. This is a mineral which exists in the Congo and to some extent in Sierra Leone. <clears throat> and it just sounds like a funny word. But it is a mineral that is used in each and every cell phone in the world. So all of you who have cell phones are using coltan coming from the Congo. And so part of the money that you are using to pay for your cell phone is going into the Congo conflict to pay for the child soldiers. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, and as I was saying, that there, there was, there's a huge kind of, we talk about military industrial complex, but this is a criminal industrial complex in many, in many ways because uh, it, it fuels and continues to fuel the conflict in, in Eastern Congo in any case. Uh, there are so many minerals, so many armed groups allied with so many 
third states and third parties, many of them with a huge criminal element to them. Now, the Security Council has done a lot of things uh, with regard to that to try to stop or to halt or put, put pressure on parties with regard to that. Um, it, it is a it is a, a constantly evolving and very, very um, intricate system that is constantly adjusting it itself to keep ahead of the Security Council, to keep ahead of member states about how to follow that money. So it is, it is a big, big challenge. Uh, Ambassador, your, your, your third question there was what are the solutions since we have this everywhere? I mean, if you're talking about Latin America, you, uh, we used to have child soldiers in Guatemala, that has now calmed down. Colombia still has a huge amount of children in the FARC and in uh, and the uh, other armed groups that are, are there. Africa, as you know, throughout the, 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 the region of, of Africa, including in North Africa, Libya, uh, child soldiers continue to be used. The Middle East is now a hotbed. Uh, it used to be very, quite calm, but it is now with the Syria conflict really heating up, uh, and we're seeing uh, much more use than we are normally uh, looking at uh, in that region. Um, Asia, Southern Asia, we also have, uh, with the Maoist insurgency in India, uh, we have in Afghanistan. We had in Nepal until we got the Maoists to sign on to release the children, and they did. It took us three years, but we got them to, to, uh, to release their children in Nepal. Sri Lanka, of course, a sadder story. Uh, the LTTE or Tamil Tigers were wiped out, and with them probably a huge amount of children. But we were able to access the other children who were captured uh, after they were decimated and were able to access them and, and to put them into rehab uh, programs with the assistance of the Sri Lankan government. Uh, Myanmar still, a huge amount of child soldiers. Philippines, quite a few. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're not only talking about child soldiers, our mandate is wider in the sense that we talk about uh, attacks on schools and hospitals. And uh, if you read our report to the Security Council, which will come out in early June, one of the worst areas in the world to be a student is, in fact, southern Thailand, uh, where there have been summary executions of five uh, teachers in front of students uh, in their schools in the south uh, provinces in the last year alone. So, uh, and we have countless uh, children who've been killed at school or on the way to school, countless uh, schools bombed there, and it actually outstrips Afghanistan at this point. But nobody really knows about it unless you read our report. Now, uh, Ambassador, um, what do we do about it? Uh, and you mentioned Article 41 on sanctions, Article 42 on, 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 on the use of force. Um, again, our, our office is created by the General Assembly, uh, but our, we have had a huge engagement with the Security Council over the last 10 years. Uh, and we have seven resolutions, which you can look on our website. Uh, you can go to Children in Armed Conflict, uh, just Google it, it's there. And, they have developed an entire infrastructure inside of the Security Council, including a working group, which is a subsidiary body of that council, that looks at reports coming out of 15 country situations that we cover every two months uh, and make recommendations both to, the, to governments and to, to non-state armed, armed groups, as well as to the UN. Uh, whether or not we do a good enough job, I would say uh, we can never do a good enough job until we get the, the issue cleared away. Um, but we are trying, we are also pulling all the levels of, uh, of national and international accountability with regard to those who abuse children in, in armed conflict, not only using them as child soldiers, but also bringing them into the harm's way by lack of distinction and bombardment, something that we're seeing uh, with the Syrian conflict very, very much. So, uh, Can I ask you one final question before we open to our universities? Yeah. Since the concept of children in armed conflict is linked to the number of conflicts themselves and the fact that the number of conflicts has grown exponentially after the end of the Cold War, that is say after 1990. This means that we are on a losing streak, that you are not bringing down the number of children in our conflict, they are increasing because the conflicts are increasing and so you are fighting against the tide. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, I would I have to say that you're wrong, Mr. Ambassador, respectfully, in, in a sense that, yes, you're right and you're wrong. Uh, I think you're right factually. We are seeing many more conflicts uh, across the uh, globe. 
But some of them, and these are the, easy, the, these are the ones that we should study more, don't use ch children. They may have massive amounts of violence, but they don't use children. And they've done it in the past and will do it in the future without children. Um, at the same time, you are very right that since 1990, there has been an explosion of conflicts, especially, well, throughout the globe. Uh, and it is having uh, a deleterious effect on children's livelihoods, not only when they're involved as child soldiers, but because they get in the way. Uh, and I think it's also because we've lost the stability, even though it had many, many... Um, the Cold War was very stable in one way, but not, not very helpful in another, and we can't get into that at, the, at, this, um, at this point. But since, since the, the, the breaking of that kind of stalemate, uh, there, it's become so multipolar, and so many different actors are now active in so many areas, um, and it's so easy to obtain enough weaponry uh, and, and enough kind of force to get yourself on the map. Uh, and oftentimes, again, when they lack that uh, manpower, they will use children. And I think that, yes, we are in, in a way fighting against the tide, but we have had success. We have had thousands, probably tens of thousands now, of children released even before the conflict ended uh, because we've pressured them. All armed actors, including those who use terror tactics, have friends somewhere. And those friends are oftentimes embarrassed when children armed conflict comes up. Because even if you want to push your sometimes very uh, forceful uh, political uh, opinion on, on, onto a country or onto the world, everyone has a, a soft spot for children. Um, and uh, it is something that we have to play on. It's something that we do play on. And, it, and it's that pressure from member states to, to use sanctions. And we have used sanctions in, on eight persons in the Cote d'Ivoire and DRC to get them into compliance. And it has worked and we have released. We, it's not uh, something that is a, a grand success, but uh, it is more than we could hope for if we didn't do what we're doing now. Uh, let's go to universities. We'll start with Bronx for two questions and they're then out. go to Lock Haven. They're out, they're questions. out. Bronx is out. Okay, we, we'll say we'll start with Lock Haven for two questions and then go to Mercy for two questions. Over to Lock Haven. Good morning, Dr. Kamal and Mr. Wargo. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, presenting this topic to us. Um, I'll just turn it over to one of our uh, our students here for their question. Good morning. I want to know, my name is Trisha Zapata, and I wanted to find out how do you prevent this from happening again in the future? Do you have a larger force backing you, and, and if so, what's, what's that structure like? Is there another question? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ann Hoyt. I'm a early childhood and special education dual major here at Lock Haven. Um, I was wondering if the program was looking into providing the children and families in the high conflict areas with services such as education or health care to help lure them and their families from the false promises provided by the um, militias or um, other rebel groups in their areas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, how do we prevent this from happening, and do we have a larger force? I, it's, a, it's a good uh, question. I think for us, information is power in, in, in many senses, and, and getting in or getting the UN in there early, reporting on what is actually happening is important. Uh, it sounds uh, a little bit like a no-brainer, but uh, the UN is very slow to act on the ground, and its information gathering uh, for accountability purposes, its structure is a little bit weak. And so uh, for, that's, uh, for example, why I have to go out to the, the Syria region to do some of the investigations myself. Um, prevention is about information, it's about us getting the information to, to start to press parties to warn them of the responsibilities under international humanitarian and human rights law early on uh, and, to, and to bring that information to the Security Council if it's, if it's uh, something that is uh, adequate. Um, Larger force, it's good that you mentioned it. Um, our best operations are where we have peacekeeping operations. Uh, and those are uh, Security Council sanctioned uh, peacekeeping operations in particular country situations. And when we have those troops on the ground, 
uh, and those specialists, like child protection advisors, and sometimes there are up to 20 of them in a, in a large country setting, they get us that information and do the advocacy on the ground right away. Uh, unfortunately, there are many conflicts around the world of which the Security Council is either not seized, which means there is no peacekeeping or, uh, or peace enforcement mission, and we are left to deal with uh, country teams that are more development oriented, and so it, it's very hard for us to do that kind of upfront uh, prevention. Um, the, the, you can also go out to the website of the DPKO, which is the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. They have an entire sub-website on child protection advisors. I'm a former child protection advisor with the mission in Congo, and that is their everyday job. Uh, and it's something that's quite interesting and you might want to look into. On uh, providing children with services, it's also a, a very astute uh, kind of observation the very fact that they don't have services is what really sucks them in to, to these, either gets them subjected to abductions um, or, or to, to being tricked uh, into uh, payments that never come about. Um, many, many, uh, and again, every situation is, quite, is, is different because some of them are ideological. And for example, if you look at the Maoists in, in, uh, in uh, Nepal, uh, they recruited in schools, so they were recruited in. They were recruited inside of a state service, which is schooling. Um, now the, the the teachers were often harassed uh, and made. Uh, uh, well, many of them left uh, because they were harassed. But those they also used those schools as basically fulcrums for uh, launching recruitment drives. Uh, and so, the, whether or not we have services, sometimes the services themselves become the, the center point for for a, a, a vicious kind of recruitment drive. So we have to watch. It's not exactly the same. But it is a great point because if you had more children in school and in uh, communities that weren't uh, damaged, uh, we'd have a much easier time preventing. Uh, I'd like to come in on this, both the questions, because these are important questions uh, which have been asked by Lockhaven. <coughs> My own work, unlike uh, Mr. Vargos, who is the top-down person because he is there for countermeasures, my work is on motivation, so I'm a bottom-up person in, in this, on this subject of terrorism and terrorist, terror tactics. The problem of motivation is a problem of fundamental injustices which exist in the world. And you have to take note of them because your basic assumption is that all's well with the world. And it is these horrible rebels who are doing funny things. It's just not true. You have fundamental injustices everywhere in the world. You take the Congo. The Congo is by far the richest country in the world in terms of minerals. It has everything. Gold, diamonds, coltan, you name it, they have it. But the Congo is a huge country with nine neighbors. Each of these neighbors has a straw sucking out the blood of the Congo. And these are international multinational corporations who are there sucking the mineral blood out of the Congo. And so they build up their own uh, friends whom you can call rebels, you can call them uh, associates of the multinational corporations. But there is an injustice in sucking the blood of a country for external profit rather than for the profit of the people themselves. In the case of Palestine, you, which is the suicide bombers, you have 5 million refugees for 65 years whose lands have been expropriated, who are living under occupation with no future and no solution at all. And so they, they, they have their backs to the wall. And what do they do? The only thing they can do is to put on a suicide vest and go and blow themselves up because that is their only option. You go to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has a division between two completely different ethnicities. You have the Tamils in the north and the Sinhalese in the south. And the two don't get along. They have different languages, different customs. They, they, they should not be in, the, in a sing, single country. And so they fight with each other. And in the process, they kill each other. And then you have Myanmar. Myanmar, same problem. You have a tribal structure in the north, which is the Kachins. 
you have the Rohingyas in the south, which is a totally different religion. And so there is a fundamental divide in Myanmar. And the same is true of Nepal, <coughs> where you have a feudal government and a left-wing insurgency. In other words, it's a political problem. Now, all these problems are real problems. And so we, the, the fact of the child soldiers or the child victims is a consequence of the real problems. And my problem is that we are not addressing the problems at all. <clears throat> we are only telling Mr. Vargo, go stop the children from being, from be, from dying or from using guns. He can't. He cannot. Because the problems are so endemic and so deep that they have to find an outlet. And the only outlet that they have is to put all their energy, including the energy of their children, into the conflict. Your second question, again, had an assumption behind it. Because you said, why not give them education and health? You cannot. The definition of underdevelopment is a country that has no education and no <coughs> health. If we had education and health, we would not be underdeveloped countries. The fact that we are underdeveloped is that we don't have the facilities for that. Even a country like Pakistan, which is far more developed than anything that Mr. Vargo has spoken about, in Pakistan, you, <coughs> you most walls don't have a switch to put on the light because there's no electricity and so there's no switch. And in those places where you have a switch, you put on the switch and nothing happens because the, the light, the electricity is missing so the bulbs don't work. And so a middle income country like Pakistan, it's not a minor country. Pakistan has 180 million people living well, eating well. <clears throat> but obviously underdevelopment is a very harsh reality. And you have to come to terms with it. Because instead of asking the question, why not give them education and why not give them health, find a way in which resources can be better transferred from the rich countries who are only 2% of the population of the world, consuming something like 40% of the resources of the world. If you add all the Western world, that's 28 countries, that's 20% of the population consuming 86% of the resources of the world. So if you are consuming 86% of the resources, please don't look at me and say, Ambassador Kamal, why are your bones sticking out? My bones are sticking out because you are eating all the food yourself. Sorry to be so harsh on Lock Haven. Over to Mercy for two questions from Mercy, and then we'll go to Thompson. <coughs> Um, my question is, uh, how much support are you receiving from the General Assembly, the Security Council, as, rest, as well as the rest of the UN to prevent children from fighting in the wars? Hello. Um, my question is, uh, you guys touched upon the difficulties facing child soldiers when they return to their communities. So I was just wondering, um, have you found that there is a lot of stigma surrounding these former child soldiers? Good question. Thank you for those. Um, with regard to the support that we're receiving from the GA, the, uh, the GA uh, has a, a yearly, what we call, um, omnibus resolution on, on children, uh, of which we're a small part. Um, the GA, as you know, uh, is, is the structure that defines uh, the major themes that uh, the, the UN should be working on. It's, it's all Hundred, how many is it now? Hundred and ninety-four. Five. What? Countries. One ninety-three. One ninety-three. Excuse my, my ignorance on that. It changes almost every year now. 193 countries uh, getting together. They give us our mandate, but they don't really do anything about accountability because we're, we, we're more about the punishment and accountability. That's our, that's our role as an office. We're a very small office. Uh, and so they don't like uh, the, the GA, though it still does have some uh, human rights um, resolutions has tended to do less of that, uh, which is why we have a much uh, more productive relationship with the Security Council. 
We also have a relationship with the, the, the uh, Human Rights Council uh, in a different way. Uh, and so from the Security Council, again, they have an entire structure of which we provide reports and they give uh, basically orders to governments and to non-state actors to cease uh, on certain things. They also bring a huge amount of attention to, to through our reports, to the Secretary General's reports, on the issue so that we get from member states and other donors money to the UNICEFs and to I International Labour Organization and UNHCR and others that are doing a huge amount of the of the programs with these children, both on monitoring what's happening to them and then and then when they come out, what's going, you know, how do we better uh, reintegrate them? Um, with regard to difficulties when uh, children return to the communities, they're they're huge because they probably had difficulties before they even left. Um, I have met children who, who were abducted by, by mothers who came every day to my office to try to look for them, and when they were found, it was much easier, even though the child had suffered in an in uh, armed conflict uh, setting in the sense that he was under a commander and was made to kill. So that's one thing. But when the, the child left, and there's so many stories of this, the child left his family, basically, before he joined the armed group because the mother remarried or because the, the issue with the parents was, was not good or because there had been uh, the, all kinds of social problems inside of the household. That is much more difficult because you didn't, you didn't leave a, a functioning family, you left a family that was already dysfunctional. Uh, and sometimes a community that had, had become weak and dysfunctional as well. And so getting those children back is very, very challenging. You have to go through two or three levels. The first is getting them separated and, and dealing with the with the, psycho, the, the trauma that they had from, from uh, being in an armed group, what it does to them uh, if they're forced to kill or if they're forced to see things that they, that, uh, for example, other killings or massacres or uh, suffering actually physically. Um, including rape, uh, both girls and boys, uh, is one thing. Secondly is to get them back into their families that may have been broken already. And thirdly, some of these children were forced, in, in many circumstances, Northern Uganda being a big one, forced to commit atrocities against their own communities in order to keep them on board. Uh, and that's the worst one because if you go to Northern Uganda even now and you see these children have come out, there's a huge stigma against them. Even if they didn't do anything particular, um, they're all seen as murderers, even if they're 10 years old when they left. Uh, and it's hard for a community to accept people who may or may not have killed members of their family. Uh, and there's transitional justice that can be put underway, uh, but in, in a lot of places that, that where it's very poor, that, that doesn't hit the ground very, very quickly. Uh, and children grow up very quickly, and so they move on, uh, and so you have a very small window. Uh, but it, it's stigma and the, the psychodynamics, or the, the trauma that these children go through is a huge, huge issue, and, and we're studying it and trying to adjust the way we do things all the time. We'll take two questions from Towson, followed by two questions from Vancouver. Good afternoon, uh, Ambassador Kamal. Uh, unfortunately, we lost our connection for much of the preliminary discussion, but we do have two questions we'd like to pose. So I'll turn things over to uh, our students. Uh, thank you very much for you know letting us do this. Um, so the first question I had was on. Oh, uh, sorry. My name is Darby Levin, and I go to um, George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology, um, and so. It mentioned on the worksheet that we, you know, looked over that the SR or the um, the special representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict uh, does not have field offices and does not work with the government institutions in the countries where the problems are very prominent. Um, instead, it attempts to work with other non-governmental organizations or international organizations, and so. I was wondering if you felt whether or not the SR, um, as the General Assembly's arm into the issue of child soldiers, would be more effective if it maintained field offices and or contact with the problematic governments um, of the organizations, you know, in the countries affected, and would this be possible or what restrictions or downsides exist to this?
Hi, my name is Ivana Jukic. I'm a political science international studies double major here at Towson University. And I had a question um, specifically about the psychological effects of war and armed conflict on children. Typically, you hear of immediate responses in terms of medical supplies and food aid to these countries and uh, children in need. But in terms of when the war ends, the world tends to quickly forget about these victims, and the psychological traumas often last for years. And as these children are the future leaders of their countries, I was wondering what kind of long-term programs exist to help the children who suffer such effects, such as PTSD, like the child, so child soldiers you were mentioning earlier, and what the UN's role is in this capacity. Amazingly good questions from uh, Towson. Congratulations to the students who have asked these questions. Over to you, sir. Okay. <laughs> we, again, we don't have field offices, but we work through either uh, the peacekeeping missions or through what we call UN country teams, which is uh, all the offices of UNICEF, ILO, UNHCR, and what other, whatever other um, organizations of the UN are on the ground. Um, we do, uh, I don't know, maybe we put something out that was misleading, but we do work with governments. Um, and my special representative, one of her major jobs is to go out to speak to governments and to non-state actors uh, when the government agrees on the ground. Uh, for example, in, in November of last year, uh, my special representative went out with us to, to Yemen uh, to meet with the government about their issues with the use of child soldiers and then was given the permission to go up to see the Al Houthi rebels in the north to deal with that problem. So. Uh, we do. We also deal with, uh, we work through um, the country team and, and via the country team or the mission through NGOs, both international and local. Um, we have a heavy interaction. Uh, when we do sign an action plan, the government and the government ministries have to be on board and often sign on to those action plans, which are these kind of contracts of, uh, with activities and timelines of activities of when we can release these children or other commitments such as not occupying schools when a military goes into a zone, for example. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry we, we misled you with any materials about uh, the fact that we didn't work with governments. We do. As a GA mandated office, uh, I think the GA would be highly displeased if we didn't work with governments. Um, what we're unusual in uh, is that we work so, so much with uh, non state actors. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we recognize them politically. And every time we sign uh, these action plans with them, there's a, a caveat at the bottom saying that we do not, the UN does not recognize uh, uh, the, the, the goals and the group politically, but, uh, but only to bring uh, to bear their responsibilities under applicable international and, uh, and human right, uh, humanitarian and human rights law. So I think that um, I, I, uh, we do a huge amount of work with governments, uh, not only at governments that have issues or non-state actors in their countries that have issues, we also work with governments to help us to push other governments that maybe could do more. Um, uh, and we do that through regional organizations, uh, such as the European Union, uh, we have a huge child uh, and, and armed conflict policy with the European Union to support projects, but also to, to undertake demarches or, or advocacy messages with uh, governments and non-state actors when it's uh, applicable. Um, for example, uh, we are now touching base already uh, through some intermediaries uh, and go other governments who are friendly to them with the Free Syrian Army because they do have a problem with child soldiers and they have reacted that they will uh, allow us in to take a look and that they have already uh, sent us uh, their assurances that they want to uh, s prevent and stop any further use of, of children among their forces. So uh, we do work very much with both um, governments, non-state actors, but also the wider community of child protection actors such as um, even churches uh, and, and other religious institutions around the world, but also through regional organizations, which are, which are state-based as well. Uh, we have a, a now a new uh, program also with the African Union. Uh, we have child guidelines agreed with NATO, uh, and, so, and so on and so forth. On the second question, uh, Yvonne, uh, the psychological effects, um, it's a good question because uh, there are experiences, if you want to look up further on it, one of the best NGOs in the world uh, that I've dealt with is War Child Holland, uh, who have uh, an entire specialization on psychosocial support for child soldiers on the ground. Um, it's not enough, and it's never long-term long -term enough, because the funding that we receive on the ground, or our partners receive on the ground, is often um, 
one, two years maximum uh, and to do a, a really good program on psychological uh, reintegration of children into communities, UNICEF and others say that you need three to five years. Uh, and so all of our projects, though they may be good, often end before they should. I'd like to comment on uh, the first question, which was that of a presence in the field. You see, the United Nations, for all its grandil grandiose name, is a tiny organization. <clears throat> the total strength of the United Nations is less than the uh, total strength of the New York police force. And the total budget of the UN is less, is far less than the budget of the New York police force. So you have a global organization, but which just does not have neither the staff strength nor the financial resources to be world government. It cannot do it. And so the objective of the UN is not to row, but to steer and to give you ideas and to coordinate those ideas. Now, I know that I was the chairman of the board, executive uh, board of uh, the High Commission of Refugees, and we had a budget of $1.2 billion. And we had uh, uh, about 16 million refugees to take care of. And there was no way in which the uh, High Commission for Refugees could do it. The total staff strength of the High Commission for Refugees was 350 staff. And so you had to depend on civil society in the field. Civil society is one of the greatest developments in the world because they are good, they are present in the field, and they have fantastic financing behind them because of people like you at Towson who believe in civil society and therefore contribute to them. And so civil, out of the budget of $1.2 billion of the High Commission for Refugees, almost 80% was dispersed in the field through NGOs and not directly by the High Commission for Refugees because we did not have the facilities to do it ourselves. So we used good NGOs to do the work in the field. And that is exactly what Mr. Varga is talking about when he says that we are using good NGOs in the field as support and extension staff. Because I don't know his department in the UN, I don't know how many people do you have? I can't count more than three in your office. Uh, that are actually, well, we have six. So, <laughs> so high commission, high commissioner, no special representative for children in armed conflict, and you have a million children in armed conflict in uh, two dozen countries, and there are six people doing this. And so you notice the limitation. And that is why uh, I, I uh, do criticize Mr. Vanga a lot, but I commend him for being able to do so much with so little facilities at his disposal. <clears throat> Over to uh, Vancouver for two questions, followed by TNEC for two questions. Vancouver is all uh, good day, Your Excellencies. with a, with, with a very full room. Yeah. Uh, good day, Your Excellency. My name is Felix. I study communications and business here at Vancouver. Uh, I would like to know what is it that we can do from here to help dealing with the understaffed nature of the UN uh, beyond simply disseminating information through conferences like these. Thank you. Hello, um, Ambassador Kamal and Mr. Vargo. I have a similar question with Felix. I study business majoring in marketing, and there is a recent trend with social activism in marketing and corporations becoming more ethically aware to issues in the world. And one of the marketing forms that I'm in, interested in working for, uh, the CEO's inspiration came from child soldiers. He and he started a marketing firm helping helping nonprofit companies. Um, build a better brand image in order to convey their message of so social activism. 
Um, so along that line, what can corporations or companies do to help bring the awareness to child soldiers? And I can imagine there's a certain amount of risk that comes along with your job because of the conflicts. So if there is something that, that we can do, we'd like to know. Thank you. Congratulations to Vancouver for good questions. But from my point of view, congratulations even more for getting up so early in the morning for this video conference and being all present in class. To you, sir. Okay, uh, so the, the question of, of Felix, uh, which was what, we can, what can we do to help beyond uh, getting just more information out. I think, um, well, as you know, one of the things that you can take a look at and help us out, uh, because we're so small, we only have one person doing outreach for us. We do have uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts. Uh, what you can do is try to help us play with those and, and react to those online uh, with us. Uh, we do have a growing community, but it's still too small. We need multipliers. Uh, for, for a good movement. Um, I think also uh, many of you may be Canadian or if you're not uh, you, can, you can speak to your own governments. Canada is a great friend of our and, and in fact is the, is the chair of our what we call friends group, those non-council members that are very interested in the council's work on children in armed conflict. And I think that you can also uh, uh, highlight with your representatives uh, in your government uh, the need to do more uh, for child soldiers um, uh, across the board uh, and, and, and to do, do to that more swiftly. Um, on, the, on the second question, uh, which was, uh, and I'd be interested to see what, which, which uh, firm that uh, the person who used the uh, child soldiers as a, as a uh, inspiration. Um, I don't know. I think uh, the creative communities and the business communities could do more to help us out because we are so small and we spend so little time on advocacy. Uh, I, th I thank uh, Ambassador Kamal for giving us this, this opportunity to bring this to you. Um, we are interactive uh, with, uh, with our, 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 our um, website and our Facebook and are looking for assistance on that and how to get multipliers but also to have the creativity of young people uh, to, to signal to us what we should be doing more of where you are to bring to light um, the, the plight of uh, children on conflict. In Canada, there is one thing that is bothering me, uh, and I've advocated on this case for quite a, quite a long time, uh, and there has been an unsatisfactory up, up until this point um, reaction from, from perhaps, and this is obviously uh, myself speaking, but you have uh, a person who's in jail in, in, in Canada who was at Guantanamo for quite a long time, who was captured when he was 15, uh, and he still remains in jail. Uh, and we're hoping that he will get out soon, uh, because even though his family may not be the most productive one, this boy was captured uh, and shot uh, several times um, by U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Uh, accused of terrorism, tortured many times, including by Canadian uh, persons, going ostensibly to help him out. Uh, and it is a very sad case, and he still remains in a, in a, in a, in a jail in, in, I believe it's in Ontario. Uh, and I think that if you can help us to raise his case a bit uh, and the plight, uh, we advocate as an office that any child soldier, though they may be abused, though they may have been on, on, on the combat field, uh, should not be put into the enemy combatant um, uh, basket uh, and just to be to sit there uh, that to ruin a life basically uh, I don't know if he's his could be recovered but there have been other cases uh, some one that I still follow of, of uh, an Afghan boy who was also captured there and spent a long long time in, in Guantanamo without a case later released without without a case uh, and who now suffers to such to such an extent from the uh, repeated torture that he has clinical PTSD uh, and will never be normal uh, again uh, and to see his parents when, when he's at home uh, know that he will never be normal again it, it is very very um, disconcerting I think that Western governments also have to do more <clears throat> to protect children and their and their counter-terrorism efforts there have to be safeguards there have to be limits uh, to that so that is an advocacy message that perhaps you can help us out with as well. Uh, two points. Uh, I have never understood what is the meaning of enemy combatant. Uh, this is a euphemism which was developed 
the, the normal phrase was prisoners of war, but it was changed to enemy combatant in order to enable torture. So it is only a word which enables torture. And I think that is uh, beneath the dignity of uh, Western civilization to come out with this type of, uh, of, uh, of disguised uh, intellectual dishonesty. Uh, intellectual dishonesty, non-disguised rather. Mm. Um, the second point is about uh, uh, this, this, the first point that was made from Vancouver. Because it seems to me that if you have six people, I think one of those six people should be somebody who is young and who can be devoted to the social media only mm. and the extension through the social media. Because I don't think you can do it. Because the world <coughs> can only be changed by people who are below the age of 30. And you have crossed that age. <laughs> so you, your contribution is minimal to zero in future. So can't you find people who are below 30, one person, who would then be able to interact all the time with Vancouver and with, uh, with Mercy and Towson and Bronx, etc. You will get much better results <clears throat> because the secret of success is networking. Mm -hmm. Nobody can do it alone. And here are people who are willing to network with you. But you don't have the facilities to reach out to them, except in a video conference once a year, and that's not good enough. Yeah. So, take note. I have taken note. Yes. Uh, and, uh... <clears throat> Over to uh, TNEC for two questions from TNEC. We will have time. I suspect that after doing TNEC and Madison, we may have time for a quick second round of one question each. Uh, from any university which feels that it still has a question to ask. Over to Tinek for two questions. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Maria Ruiz and I am a criminal justice major at FDU uh, Metropolitan Campus. And um, I didn't know about the issue with uh, children being used as soldiers until I uh, did a paper on terror. I'm doing a paper on terrorism, and I saw how the ongoing issue is. Uh, it's a major problem in, in countries like this and, and in Afghanistan. Um, my question to you is, is there a great concern that because these children, they're being taught you know, to be at war. Is there another, uh, a greater concern that they're going to, there's going to be a new level and a new generation in terrorism? Second question. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Alfredo, and I study communication and political science. I have a question. We know that children are the most affected ones by landmines. And I, I want to ask you, what role did NGOs and civil societies, together with your office, passing the resolution banning landmines and what can we learn from this experience thank you can I, uh, I'd like to take both questions first <clears throat> uh, the first question is about new younger terrorism <clears throat> and you are absolutely right because the nature of war changed first when it went from wars between states to wars between tribes and civil wars. And so what you have now is ethnic conflicts. Paul, what's happened? Yeah, okay. So you have ethnic conflict. The nature of war changed around 1990 and we saw that change coming. And it affected the United Nations deeply because the UN had to readjust from wars between interstate wars to intrastate wars. But now a second change is taking place. And that change is from active wars using explosives to wars using cyber techniques, cyber to wars. And so future wars, you will be sitting at home and playing with your computer and destroying the country in front by killing its whole structure with 
viruses and with cyber attacks. And so the nature of war is going to change again, is changing. And the United States has understood this faster than others because the Pentagon now has one of the largest departments dealing only with cyber war in the Pentagon. And China has also understood, but other countries have not yet quite picked up the fact that wars in future will be cyber wars. On the second question regarding landmines, the problem arose because of Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, the Soviets dropped something like 30 million butterfly mines. I don't know whether you know what is a butterfly mine. It's a little mine with two wings and it is thrown from the air in thousands and it sort of rotates and comes down softly and comes onto the soil. And once it's in the sand, Afghanistan is a sandy place with lots of dust. In a few days, it gets covered with dust, so you cannot see. It's just a little golf ball, but you step on it, it blows off your leg. And so the number of blown off legs in Afghanistan is tremendous. And because Afghanistan did not have too much uh, facilities for uh, artificial limbs and things like that, Pakistan, they, all these blown legs people used to come to Pakistan and until today, which is 25 years after the end of the Afghan war, you still have at least 30 people coming in with a blown leg today into hospitals in Pakistan from Afghanistan. And the funny thing is that the Soviet Union, which planted these 30 million uh, mines in Afghanistan, got away without paying one penny in reparations to Afghanistan because they said, we are no longer the Soviet Union, we are the Russian Federation. That was the Soviet Union. And so just by changing their name, they have got away without paying reparations to a country that was physically destroyed by them. And so uh, some of us feel very upset about what has happened in Afghanistan and the fact that it's a tragedy which is continuing. Do you want to add something? No, uh, I think uh, as, as, the, as the ambassador said, the, the landmine, uh, Landmine Treaty was, was, came before uh, our office. We've always supported uh, the land, uh, landmine ban. The Landmine Treaty, the Ottawa uh, Treaty, uh, is, is fundam fundamentally altered the way that these treaties were applied, in, in a sense, because it uses NGOs uh, extremely well uh, to, to uh, apply both the monitoring of those land, that landmine ban and then the, also the, the response to that. So uh, that is one, I think, good lesson learned. And, and uh, as we know, uh, the GA passed uh, a, a treaty on uh, arms trade uh, some time ago, and that's something that we'll have to, to watch as well, uh, because it's the low-tech arms, the Kalashnikovs or whatever, that uh, really get us into trouble with children. It's the small ones. Uh, and so we watch that too with a lot of hope. Uh, I think it will take uh, some 20 ratifications, which seem to be in the offing very soon. Uh, we'll have to see how that rolls out. We have many larger states who will not sign on, unfortunately, and so we'll have to watch that. Uh, the Landmines Treaty is unlikely to have any global effect for the simple reason that a very large number of important countries are not going to sign on and ratify. And that large number of powerful countries includes the United States, uh, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Egypt, and to some extent Brazil and, so, and uh, Syria. And so you have major uh, countries uh, which are not going to sign on and ratify. And so uh, it's a great treaty, but uh, unlikely to be a major force in the future. Over to uh, Florum for two questions. Okay. Um, hello. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, what are the psychological effects on children in places like Congo who are fighting against oppressors? Um, more so, do they accept this as a way of life, or are they physically unable to rebel against participating? 
Yes, and I, I actually I have a question and uh, about your office. And what are the specific incentives that uh, your office offers to various non-state parties, uh, rebel groups perhaps in particular, to refrain from using child soldiers or to in fact even turn their, turn them over in some way? Uh, what do they What do they get out of it? Well, thank you for those questions. I, uh, the first the psychological effects in the DRC, um, again, it varies with the, with, the, with, with the experience of the particular child that, that, that has been used and what they went through. Uh, if they spent a very short time going through and, and just weren't fed for three days before they escaped, it's one thing. If, if, it's, a, if it's a war, you know, basically a, a victim of a girl who's a victim of uh, systematic rape, uh, for three years, it's quite another. Um, and so there's a different way that you have to deal with that. Um, many children in DRC, it did escape. Um, it wasn't uh, like uh, as harsh as the, with the Lord's Resistance Army where they were shot or, or those, the, their uh, colleagues were shot if they tried to escape. There were many, many children who escaped, but there were many children who escaped who were then picked up again. Uh, so that, that uh, was uh, it's an issue and, and something that uh, we had to deal with constantly about how to not only get them out and try to deal with them but also to ensure that they weren't picked up by either the same armed group or another one down the road. Uh, armed groups are incredibly good at getting information about children who have formerly been either with uh, a state force or another rebel group and they tend to pick them up quickly. Um, on the question about our office, uh, what specific incentives do we give NSAs? Our, it's not necessarily, a, 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 it's more, that's the carrot part of it. We have a, just a, a bigger stick in the sense that we uh, are now finalizing, for example, for this year, we do a yearly report of the Secretary General to the Security Council uh, on children armed conflict. And it has a, at the back of it, we don't, it's not officially called this, but it's the list of shame. Uh, and it, it currently is composed of 54 parties and... 17 country situations around the world. Uh, and that list of shame exercises a huge amount of pressure on even non-states. Parties uh, react very, very quickly, but non-state actors also react fairly quickly. You have a few outliers there, uh, Abu Sayyaf being not too uh, worldly aware, uh, but even Al-Qaeda in Iraq, even the Taliban, uh, for example, when we write our report, put out a, their own report and usually refute our report uh, every year. So they are aware of it uh, and they don't like it. Uh, many of them claim that the facts in our report are untrue, uh, but when it comes down, I, I think in many ways, uh, I don't know if you, uh, there, there are probably a lot of psych majors out there, you go through with an armed group or even a government when they're accused of having child soldiers, you go through the stages of grief. So the first one is disbelief, then it's denial, then it's anger, and then you finally have acceptance. Uh, and so we have constant discussions with these armed groups throughout. And the first one is always going to be anger uh, and denial. Uh, and then uh, you get, uh, you go through all of these kind of different stages with them. They finally figure out that they can't get out from under it by just denying it. And then it oftentimes affects their ability to raise funds internationally uh, or to uh, obtain the full support of, of their allies, both government and non-government. Uh, and so we work all of those angles with that list. Um, and again, these lists and these reports are all on our website, and you can take a look at them. Um, and uh, we will be putting our next one out in early June, uh, and it usually has a huge amount of, uh, of press around it. So that is really the major way that we do it. We also engage, we have the tools to engage. Uh, when, we, when we put together the list of shame, the council also demanded that we, we uh, put in a way of getting off the list of shame, which are these action plans, these contracts of activities with time-bound uh, uh, um, well, time bound activities uh, to release children, to hold those accountable who, who continue to use children, um, and, and various other activities uh, to get off this list. And that, that has to be observed, and we have to have access to observe that. Uh, we have about five minutes left. We can do a very quick round of quick question, one quick question and a very quick response. Uh, does uh, Lockhaven have a question? Yes, my name is Lindsay McClellan, and my question is, has the lack of regulation in international arms trade led to the increase of armed conflicts? 
and children participating in those armed conflicts? Now, let me take that question. The problem is not a lack of, uh, of, uh, of uh, structure in the world arms trade. The problem is that the world arms trade is a very money-making activity. It's one of the growth industries in the world. Arms trade is more than a trillion dollars a year. And people are, love the arms trade because it sustains industry everywhere in the arms exporting countries. And so, I'm sorry, you are not going to be able to control the flow of arms because it is one of the most lucrative forms of economic activity for countries which are major producers of arms. And so, the arms trade treaty, uh, uh, I'm sorry, is not going to produce very many positive results. Over to Mercy for a question if they have one. <coughs> They're out. They're out. Okay. Uh, Towson, do you have a question? Is it? Yeah, here you go. Yes. Um, hi, uh, Ambassador Kamal and Mr. Wargo. Uh, my name is Camila Shanley. I am a student at a local high school um, and I'm involved with the um, Towson University Model UN program. My question is that for the children and women and people who escaped armed conflicts, would it be feasible for them to work in the field offices as there is um, a low number of workers? Obviously there's only six, six people in the office. Um, if it could be a good way to reintroduce them um, back into the workforce. Yeah, can you use these children as interns in the field? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it, there there are also labor laws. So uh, if they're under, if they're certainly under sixteen and probably under eighteen, we don't tend to use them because they should be in school. Um, but uh, we do have outreach groups with um, both child soldiers who have come out and um, uh, and to some extent their families. So women would be included in that. Um, we don't necessarily use them in the field because, uh, well, they're, they're also having their own programs and it's the NGOs that are dealing with them either for rehabilitation or for support to those families. And they, of course, uh, utilize the expertise of, of, of women, less so children, uh, I must say, because of a labor law issue. But um, we, we do have, from, from our part, because again, we don't have the field offices, we work through others. Um, for our part, we do have actually a growing community of former child soldiers that we use for advocacy purposes around the world. And there are former child soldiers in almost every country. Uh, and we've also had former child soldiers come uh, during our open debate in the Security Council to present for us or present with us, in fact, uh, including a, a girl who's now up, uh, up in Massachusetts studying uh, her master's, who was a former um, combatant with the, with the LRA. Um, as she gave uh, a great statement uh, about her experience at the council. We've had a girl from, from Nepal come in, who was a former Maoist uh, cutter in Nepal, come in uh, to do the same. Uh, and we have a whole kind of uh, a group of uh, former child soldiers who do advocacy on our part, both here and abroad. Uh, uh, a question from Vancouver. Uh, hello, Your Excellence. Um, my name is Mohammed from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm, stand, uh, I'm a sophomore, uh, sophomore uh, business student here in Vancouver. Uh, my question is, uh, how can children's uh, rights uh, be standardized uh, in the world? And uh, how can children enjoy the same ba uh, basic rights everywhere? Uh, what can we do? Thank you. I'll take this question. There is, there is a standardization of children's rights. There is a treaty called the Convention on the Rights of the Child and it is widely uh, signed and ratified. In fact, there are only two countries in the world which have not signed and ratified uh, and I won't name one out of politeness to the soil on which we stand uh, and the other uh, country, as far as I know, is uh, either Somalia or Sudan. Somalia. Mm -hmm. Somalia. So, rights of the child are recognized. The problem is not in the treaties or in the standardization. The problem is in the implementation. 
And that implementation, I'm afraid, is very faulty. And we all are responsible. It is not the treaty which is responsible. It is you, Sheikh Mohammed, and myself. We are responsible for not doing enough for children in the world. So the fault is ours. Uh, I'm going to jump to TNEC first and then finish with the florum. TNEC, do you have a question? We don't, you have a question? We don't have any questions. Okay, can I come to uh, Florum finally to, for a question and then to close the session from the Florum end? I don't think we have any, we don't have any, any further student questions, but, uh, but I have a question as to why, you, why don't you use the uh, International Criminal Court's definition of, uh, of a child soldier as the basis for uh, working with, uh, with groups? In other words, you'd be restricting yourself to the below 15 year olds and uh, why do you want to, why do we use the optional protocol as the basis because the international criminal court is not a part of the un system we are in the un here the international criminal court is an independent organization established by an independent group of countries who are called the quote unquote contracting parties who have established the International Criminal Court. It is not part of the UN system. Mm -hmm. And it has a very limited function. Its function is only three types of uh, crimes which are defined in treaties, which are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And a fourth crime, which they have half agreed upon, which is called aggression, and which they will finally agree upon by the year 2017. And so it's a, it's a different setup altogether. It has nothing to do with the United Nations. The only link between the International Criminal Court and the United Nations is that their definitions of their jurisdiction are taken from international treaties which have been negotiated under the UN system. And the fact that the Security Council can refer a matter to the International Criminal Court. That is the only link between the two. If I, uh, yeah. if I might add uh, on that, it, it's also practical uh, for us. We, if we use the ICC's definition, it, it, it reflects exactly IHL. And you know that IHL was, it was devised, that part of it was devised in 1947, 48. So it's very old uh, and, and less than, I would say, uh, it doesn't cover a lot of what we're looking at, which is between you know the 16s and above. And as, as we've said, since the time of the IHL or the Geneva Conventions, there, uh, there has been a huge amount of progress in the way the international community looks at children and tries to protect them through human rights and even uh, some of the humanitarian instruments. And so that's why we have a difference between what is a war crime, which is the use under 15, which is a, a fairly limited, although we're, we're talking hundreds if not thousands of children, and the tens or hundreds of thousands of children who are between 15 and 18 uh, who also need that protection. So I think that's the reason why one of the, is a war crime, the other is a is either a treaty, a failure of the treaty to respect the treaty, or, or a failure to, to protect children in general. Professor Rosen, I leave it to you to close this session from your end. Okay, so well, well, let me thank both of you, both uh, Mr. Wargo and Ambassador Kamal, for a terrific discussion of this issue. And we, uh, as always, we appreciate your being here today. Today's session will be posted on uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University's Global Education website as part of the United Nations Pathways video conference series. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, thank and may I on your behalf, all your behalves, and on my own behalf, thank Mr. Vargo for taking time off to spend us and walk us through this very, very important subject. Until we meet again, goodbye from the Ambassadors Club.